Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished venerables, distinguished delegates, excellencies, good afternoon. I have some serious remarks I want to give you, and my theme is that the legacy of His Majesty Kun Bhumipan and Buddhism are two things which UNESCO can take and incorporate in its work dealing with cultures and issues around the world. I want to suggest as a layperson that there are universal aspects of Buddhism in a practical way, which His Majesty made real, which can be applied by every person if they want to and all around the world. But before I start, I have some introductory comments. Uh, the first is, I, in walking here this morning on the fence outside this room, um, there is a picture, a UNESCO picture, of the stone inscription of King Ramkamheng uh, from Sukhothai in Thailand. Um, and he was also a great Buddhist king who, who was very famous for ruling justly. And the famous phrase I learned when I was a teenager in Thailand, nai na mi khao, nai na mi pla, right? There's, there's rice in the, in the land and there's fish in the water. But the more important part, perhaps, of the King Ramkamhang inscription is the passage about the bell. King Ramkamhang put a bell outside the palace in Sukhothai. And any person in the kingdom who felt that he or she had been wronged could go ring the bell and the king would come to establish justice. And there's a picture of that inscription outside the UNESCO headquarters. This goes to show that the Buddhist tradition of leadership is a very old tradition. Secondly, um, I'm very honored to be here speaking at UNESCO for kind of uh, an odd reason, which is that in 1966, in a village in Northeast Thailand, um, I stumbled, fell on the ground, and I was on top of some old pots. And so I am credited with discovering uh, the Bronze Age culture of Banqiang in Northeast Thailand, which today is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So since I'm a discoverer of a UNESCO World Heritage Site, now I have the chance to speak in UNESCO, and it is uh, an honor for me. We are here today to take wisdom from the thinking and actions of His Majesty King Pumipon Adulyadet, the ninth king of the Chakri dynasty, for our constructive use in creating sustainable societies of peace. But before I go on, I would like to begin with a personal disclosure, because this fact shapes my personal appreciation for the work of His Majesty as King of Thailand. His Majesty and my father were good friends. My dad, Kenneth Young, was Jack Kennedy's ambassador to Thailand in the early 1960s. He met frequently in private with His Majesty, and from time to time shared with me his feelings and judgments about His Majesty's ideas and plans for Thailand. One of my dad's stories about His Majesty resonated on the social justice issue of judging other cultures. So uh, some of you may have seen, there was a movie back then, 1962, I think, called The Ugly American. The world premiere was to be in Bangkok. The actor was Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando was playing the American ambassador in this Southeast Asian country. And the, the king, their majesties, the king and queen, were going to attend the world premiere. President Kennedy heard of this and was not happy. He considered the book The Ugly American uh, an unfair attack on his new frontier doctrine of containing communist subversion in villages around the world. He took the book and the movie to be an affront to the American mission of defending freedom. President Kennedy then instructed my dad to call in the king and ask the king, as a personal favor to President Kennedy, don't go attend the opening. So His Majesty heard out my dad with respect, and then he smiled and he leaned forward 
And he said, but Ken, you Americans have the movie, The King and I, which was about his majesty's predecessor, King Rama IV. His majesty once said, a nation is made up of various institutions in the same way as all the organs which make up a living body. Life or a body can endure, can be sustainable, because the organs, large or small, function normally. Likewise, a nation can endure because its various institutions are firm and fully discharging their respective duties. Here we can hear His Majesty speak of what today we call sustainability. And our topic is sustainability in peaceful societies. But bodies can die and nations can fall apart. His Majesty was wise in that knowledge too. He once said, quote, the danger, the publicized danger is communism, but the greed of our own people is more dangerous. If we clash too much among ourselves, we will become slaves of what I call the new imperialism, be it communism or dictatorship or whatever, close quote. Where there is greed, His Majesty argued, there will be disruption of proper order among institutions and thereafter a loss of national well-being. The foundations for peace will crumble away in discord and self-promotion. I was honored to have only one audience with His Majesty. It was in 1984 in the Grand Palace. His Majesty, in a quiet but firm voice, shared with me his concern for the future of Thailand. And with due respect for the venerables in the room, His Majesty was worried about the Sangha, that the Sangha itself was not impervious to temptations and inner motivational and emotional perturbations set off by greed. He was worried that if the Sangha itself could not rise above material possessions, money, and the embellishment of temples, then how could the Thai people and the Thai political leaders, generals, civil servants, party potentates, also keep their equilibrium intact? We are here today and tomorrow to reflect on His Majesty's contributions to peace and to learn from his wisdom and example. What then is peace? Let us begin with a definition that we may justly and properly assign credit to His Majesty's thinking and example. Peace is bonding together. When the world is broken, it will not be peaceful. The word peace in our English language following the Latin usage of Pax, is derived from the Indo-European root of Pag or Pac, which means to fasten together. Another derivative of the root is Pacissi, which means a bargain or an agreement. To pacify had a meaning of to bind together by agreement, to make a pact. Peace is bringing people together, not having them fragmented and separated. Thus, Peace demands people binding themselves together through an intentional meeting of the minds. In other words, peace cannot be imposed. It can only be willingly accepted by those who are going to live with each other peacefully. This very understanding of peace was confirmed by the famous Roman writer Tacitus when he wrote, Solitudum faciunt, pacem appellant. They left desolation and solitude, and they called it peace. In other words, in his day, the armies would leave everyone in solitude. They would go through and destroy and leave people alone and cut off and broken apart. No community, fragmentation. But they called it peace because people were quiet. Today, our world, in many ways, is broken into fragments. People are not in agreement. They do not feel bound to one another. Some are terrorists, striking out at those they deem to be heretics and heathens. Others are inspired to separation by convictions of conscience, ethnic antagonism, national ambitions for hegemony, or economic inequalities. To what can we turn for binding up the wounds which are triggered by our human nature? 
His Majesty King Rama IX provided us with two practical answers taken from the first teachings of the Buddha. And here I want to speak in lay terms about the application of Buddhism in our daily lives. In front of these venerables, in front of Anil Sakya, descendant of the Sakya family, uh, I am in no position to speak and talk about Buddhist um, philosophy and theory. But His Majesty took these ideas and made them real and practical. First in politics and second in the economy and business. He proposed for politics the Buddhist principles of the Tosapit Rajatam, the principles of, of the righteous ruler, the righteous king. And secondly, he proposed sufficiency economy principles. Each of these things is taken from the Buddha's teachings and applied to the problems of our times. Buddha presented his understanding of the human condition as a pathway to sustainability. There's an analysis of the early Buddhist teachings of the Buddha himself in his first basic sermon, which relates to sustainability. He talked about the Dharma. Now, the Sanskrit root of the Dharma, which I have learned from Ajahn Anil, Dur, means to sustain, to live effectively without regress or unnecessary hardships and loss, to be a flourishing part of the eternal during our conscious time in the middle of events. The Dharma has a meaning about us, the way we live in the world from morning to dark. The root dur means to hold, to maintain, to keep, to hold up. It can take on the meaning of what is established or firm, and hence can be used in the sense of a law, which is the way I was told when I was first in Thailand, Dharma means the law. It may mean something more practical as well, sustainability in life. How do we get there? Now, I want to add at this point the teachings about the Kalesas. At the center of the Buddha's teaching is a recognition of an internal weakness. Our emotions give rise to destabilization and unsustainability inside ourselves. They prevent us from being as firm, as steady as we might, and as is possible if we understand the Dharma. These inner sensations and motivations, states of mind and heart, separate us from what is established and firm in the world around us. This separation causes us pain when we become aware of our weaknesses and when we run into opposition and frustrations or we fail in gaining our objectives. These internal emotions are called kalisas. The Dalai Lama refers to them as the afflicting emotions. They cut us off from flourishing and from a sense that all things are going well. They interpose their powers to build a wall between us and what is around us, preventing us from benefiting from reality. But the wall is not outside. The wall is only in our minds and hearts. We actually imprison ourselves. So the key to freedom is in our own minds. Classical Buddhist texts list 10 kalisas. Greed, hate, delusion, conceit, wrong views, doubt, torpor, restlessness, shamelessness, and recklessness. Now let me read you something about my country, America. A recent survey by the Pew Research Institute of Americans reveals the kalisas at work in my country today. Quote, Americans deny the other's facts, disapprove of each other's lifestyles, avoid each other's neighborhoods, impugn each other's motives, doubt each other's patriotism. You may have seen the dispute over the last week and weekend about American football players, whether they will stand up for the national anthem or sit and take a knee in protest. That's all an issue of impugning different people's patriotism. Americans can't stomach each other's news sources and bring different value systems to such core social institutions as religion, marriage, and parenthood. In short, there is little social, cultural, or political peace today in my country. The bonds of bringing people together are broken. Now, if we look quickly at these Khaleesas, how do they 
deny us access to the Dharma and sustainability. Greed forces us to look at things and others as our personal property. We exploit them. Hate acts similarly to greed. It pushes us into opposition with others in the world. Delusion misguides us, blinds us to reality. We cannot be sustainable if we don't know what reality is. Conceit is another form of delusion with similar effects on our ability to recognize the Dharma. If we're conceited, we just think about ourselves, that we have all the knowledge and insight, not the Dharma. When conceited, we think the world is made subject to our rule. We think we are in charge. Wrong views are another form of delusion. They arise in our minds when we trim and cut down for our own purposes what we see and what we learn from other people. We don't absorb a lot. We, we package it. We make it small. And wrong views often arise when we rush quickly to assumptions, when we leap to inferences. Doubt is a weakness of spirit. We lack a firm attachment to the world and its possibilities. When in doubt, we hesitate. We don't act appropriately. Torpor, slowness, holds us back. Restlessness, on the other hand, moves us too quickly. We don't reflect. We don't establish firm connections. Shamelessness is another version of conceit. Recklessness comes when we have wrong views and delusions. How can we overcome the Khaleesas? Now, if the Khaleesas, as I suggest, are a root cause of not having peace, a root cause of unsustainability, then UNESCO ought to pay attention to the Khaleesas and what we as individuals can do about them wherever we live. UNESCO should take a special interest in Buddhism and the recommendations of his majesty. I think the Buddha's sermon, his first sermon, where he talked about the Noble Eightfold Way is one way of confronting the Khaleesas and dealing with them. Right understanding, right intent, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. We can talk about these more with you and with the panel. Now, but how do we get to follow the Noble Eightfold Way? Is it easy? My sense as a lay person is we, we need some inner power in order to follow the Eightfold Way to minimize the Khaleesas and have peace. These would be the barami in, in Thai, barami or parami, or virtues. Generally, the virtues require self-control. They restrict our ego. They, they, they give us a, a sense of we have to focus ourselves and we have to focus our power. We have to take our self-nature and align it with the Dharma. So the basic parami, or parts of our character, generosity, virtue, renunciation, wisdom, energy, patience, truthfulness, determination, loving kindness, and equanimity. Each one of these characteristics, ladies and gentlemen, are part of our character. We can, we can assess ourselves. How much generosity do we feel, do we show? We can train ourselves to be stronger in the virtues. Now, what happens when we get to organizations? I've talked before about individuals. The Khaleesas operate inside individuals. Individuals can follow the Noble Eightfold Path. Individuals develop the virtue of, the, of the, the different parami. When we move to organizations, companies, governments, the Dharma does not change. The sustainability of organizations also turns on minimizing the Khaleesas in the people who are in the organizations. You have to look at the organizational culture. Now, the Dharma, when applied to the leaders of organizations, is what? 
His Majesty King Bhumipan talked about, particularly once I remember six or seven years ago, I think, I thought His Majesty said something terribly wise. He was taking the oath of judges who were being appointed to be judges in Thailand. And he said in his very sort of mild offhand way, he said that it is the function of the king under the Tosapit Rajatam to provide justice for the people of Thailand. But the king can't be everywhere. The king needs to work through judges and other officials. He said the judges in particular, and this goes back to the inscription of King Ramkam Heng of 1200, I think, 1180, something like that, about justice, that each one of those judges carries to some extent a little bit of the Tosapit Rajatam, all government officials. And you can extend this actually to private companies. People in positions of power need to think about their virtues and the Tosapit Rajatam. These are standards by which we judge the quality, the goodness, the effectiveness of political leaders. The Chronicles of Ayutthaya, of the Kingdom of Ayutthaya, there's this description several hundred years ago of a, of a Theravada ruler. It is customary that a great king of kings who upholds the ten kingly virtues be compared to the shelter of a great bow tree and that people come to seek the protection of the king's accumulated merit with the hope of escaping various calamities. King Pumipan, as you've heard before, used his accumulated merit to help the Thai people escape various calamities. Another passage from the Chronicle said that because the king was endowed with the 10 royal virtues, he was immense with the magnificence and marvelous merit of boundless wisdom and a potent force and great power to pacify royal foes. His overflowing caring practices indicated that the gods of creation, preservation, and destruction were manifest in him. Part of his virtue was to have compassion for all and to encourage the populace towards peace, happiness, and joy through his excellent justice. These are Theravada Buddhist standards in the history of, of the Thai state, which his majesty would talk about. The first of the Tosabit Rajatam is dana, giving. The second is sila, the personal capacity to live by norms and good practices, to have self-control and self-restraint. That King Bhumipan won for himself the reputation as a king who never smiled, testified to his self-control in public. Rectitude and formalism are necessary in the conduct of a truly royal person. Parasyaga, this virtue requires sacrifice for a greater good. It finds echoes in King Bhumibans following his own path with respect to development theory. This is a larger story that people need to study. He did not accept what the academics in the West and the UN experts and other people said about how to develop Thailand. He thought for himself. He followed his own path thinking about Buddhist values. Ajava, this virtue is capacity for loyalty to standards above and beyond self, truthfulness and honesty. A righteous king is there to serve something higher, the good of the people, the standards of Buddhism, not just to enjoy what comes with a royal status. Madhava, avoidance of arrogance and thinking, in thinking. King Pumipan has, was scrupulous in presenting his ideas as suggestions, not as commands. In that comment to the judges, he didn't order the judges to do this. He merely suggested that they think about the Tosapit Rajatam and how they were going to act to bring justice to the Thai people. And having talked about it, the way he resolved many critical political confrontations by not being arrogant, not imposing his will, but by suggesting to the different political leaders and factions that they needed to back down, back off, work together for the Thai people. Tapa, self-discipline. King Pumipan often demonstrated his preference for simplicity in refusing to expand royal residence. 
and in personally working on carpentry, building its own sailboats, sailing small sailboats, painting, taking photographs, hands-on hobbies, a coda, purging anger. In his six decades on the throne, there is very little evidence of King Bhumipan expressing anger at anyone. Avihimsa, a capacity for living without harming others. Again and again, King Bhumipan placed himself as king in a position of complementing other institutions, not taking over from them, but complementing them. As he said earlier, the different organs and institutions in a nation, they all have a role to play. The press, the army, political parties, the National Assembly, business elite. He sought balance and equilibrium as much as possible, rather than dictate his own preferences. Kanti, patience and perseverance. Avirodhana, reaching out to rectify misdeeds. In the political crises of 1973 and 1992, King Pumipan reached out to try to correct misdeeds that had gone on, to find a counterbalance, to blunt the selfish ambitions of military leaders who would provoke violence out of regard, the king's regard for the evolution of the country towards more responsible governance. That's in politics. Now, what about business, finance, and the economy, economic development, the material world? Poverty and want, any lack of worldly power or means, encourage our minds to make a home for the Khaleesas. That's why, from this Buddhist perspective, Poverty, hardship is hurtful because it encourages us to bring into ourselves these khaleesas, these, 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 these divisive things which prevent peace from coming up. But on the other hand, wealth also can corrupt our mind and drive away stillness, equilibrium, and equanimity, and we lose enduring happiness. Having too much or too little upsets the balance of the dharma in our lives distracting us from keeping our feet firmly on the ground as we walk through life. Therefore, conditions of peace require attention to business, finance, markets, and economic development to keep the Khaleesas down. His Majesty was keenly aware of this need to bring right mindfulness to economic activities for the individual, for the business firm, and for the nation. He promoted a doctrine called Sedicate Popian, translated as sufficiency economy. It's a recommended set of best practices. It's not highfalutin Buddhist philosophy. It's best practices to be very practical, which, which prevent shortfalls and overreaching. It's skillful risk management. It avoids disappointments, stress, and anxiety. The principles upholding His Majesty's doctrine follow a middle path, producing continuous and self-sustaining equilibria, always a balance in the economy, business, and finance in the play of supply and demand. By keeping this way, you're closer to the Dharma, you're upholding things, you're minimizing the Khaleesas, you're creating conditions for peace. There are three basic criteria. One is risk management or moderation, category of sila, systems thinking, if you will, or fully using your mind, your cognition, not closing yourself down, samadhi. And three, personal resilience, always being there, moving forward, your feet on the ground, not being knocked off your balance, panya. Risk management is following the moral sense it's gaining your virtue and character to align with natural tendencies, building up the parami, your virtues. Two, taking a systems approach is being multidimensional, knowing a lot of things about interactions which shape causation, not just focusing on one single thing. And being resilient is making yourself immune to fear, anxiety, dissidence, avoiding the hurtful consequences of change, seeing what's coming, dodging when you have to, keeping in tune with what is real, not delusional thinking, and flourishing under the circumstances, being balanced and centered as so many Buddhist monks teach us. 
Sufficiency economy is actually another version of corporate social responsibility, now sustainable development of the United, at the United Nations. His Majesty was outlining this decades ago, decades before Western scholars were talking about corporate social responsibility, and decades before the United Nations adopted 17 goals for sustainable development. In 1999, the National Economic Development Board adopted the king's idea as the guiding principle for the five-year development plan of Thailand. We can go into that, I think, later with, with my colleague. Now, is this practical or not? Our Center for Sustainability Management at the Sassian Institute of Business Administration at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok has devised an assessment process for companies which scores them according to the sufficiency economy principles, the three I mentioned, and it includes knowledge and integrity. High scores are given for full alignment and low scores for poor, poor alignment. That means we have a technique in Bangkok which can be used to assess any company in the world for alignment with underlying Buddhist values. American companies, French companies, German companies, Chinese companies, companies in Taiwan, companies in Malaysia, in Penang, can be assessed for how they think about things from the point of view of the middle way. And then three of my colleagues at Sassin, Professor Patnaporn, uh, Kun Vasin, who's a, a graduate student, and Professor uh, Kun Nick and Kun Vasu, created a scoring philosophy for Thai companies, and they looked at the Thai companies on the, on the stock exchange as to how, what's the relationship between a good Buddhist company, a company that scores high for a sufficiency economy, and their risk. And the data indicate that companies that score high in terms of Buddhist values have low risk. What, a, what economists will tell you is that low risk companies are worth more. So ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude here by suggesting that what His Majesty did in his very gracious and quiet and almost self-effacing way was to take these fundamental concepts of, of the Buddha in the first lesson and then subsequently developed about how we can be with the Dharma in life to become sustainable, to have our, as the wheel of the Dharma turns, it's not up in the air. It's something that has contact with the ground as we move forward. We can do this in politics, through the Tosapit Rajatam, to provide justice. We can do this in business, to provide sustainability. And ladies and gentlemen, let me submit to you that when politics is just and the economy is fair and productive, people will come together, they will agree with each other, they will bond, and there will be peace. Thank you very much.